Good evening and welcome. My name is Eric Plakin and I'm the medical director and CEO of the Austin Rig Center. I am delighted to welcome you to a special event this evening, Advancing Access, Parity and Payment for Quality Mental Health Care. Let me begin with a brief land acknowledgement. The Austin Rig Center is in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, a town started as a mission to the Mahikaniak or Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. With sometimes painful self-reflection and with humility, we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on their ancestral homelands. After enduring tremendous hardship and being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We honor and pay respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Thank you for joining us. You know, some may wonder why Austin Riggs is so actively involved in access to care and parity issues, given that we have long worked outside insurance. I wanted to offer a little bit of history to put this in context. <clears throat> in the 1990s, after a decade of double digit inflation and healthcare costs, and after the Clinton National Health Insurance Initiative failed, managed care expanded dramatically. There were no rules. The insurance industry chose unilaterally to limit reimbursement for mental health treatment to crisis stabilization, leading to the transformation of insurance funded inpatient and outpatient care. Once a crisis was stabilized, insurance entities would stop payment and end treatment. As a result, the length and the intensity of inpatient and outpatient treatment dropped dramatically. Faced with this environment, we at Riggs made a crucial decision. We believed that the generally accepted standard of care was not mere crisis stabilization, but rather pursuit of recovery as described by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. That is, recovery is a process over time through which an individual comes to live a self-directed life. Hence, we decided to risk sticking to our conviction. Riggs treatment would continue to focus on recovery, even though this meant operating without much insurance reimbursement. We understood that either the world would come to agree with us that more than crisis stabilization was needed, or if we were wrong, we would go out of business. Within a year, Riggs was full, and had a waiting list of 25 or 30 people, almost entirely paid out of pocket. Over the ensuing years, the landscape changed because of legislation like the Mental Health Parity Law, the Affordable Care Act, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and because of litigation like the Witt versus United Behavioral Health class action in, in which I uh, played some role as, a, as an expert. In Witt, UBH, the nation's largest behavioral health insurer, was found to have improperly substituted the goal of mere crisis stabilization for the generally accepted goal of pursuit of recovery. Most Riggs residential treatment is still private pay, but over a third of our patients have insurance that makes a significant contribution to treatment costs. And in our one-year-old remote access IOP for college students and other emerging adults in Massachusetts and New York, every patient is covered by insurance or steep discounts. And more than 50% are diverse in terms of gender, gender identity or BIPOC status. Full implementation of parity will improve coverage for RIGS and for other similar programs that pursue recovery. But this is still a distant goal. In fact, a 2022 Department of Labor review of 150 insurance companies revealed that not one was able to provide evidence that it had achieved parity. Not one. Programs like this evening's are a step toward the goal of implementing parity, increasing access to care, and reducing shameful health disparities. Now I'm happy to introduce Dr. Linda Michaels. Linda Michaels, PsyD MBA, is a psychologist in private practice in Chicago. She's chair and co-founder of the Psychotherapy Action Network, or CYAN, a nonprofit that advocates for therapies of depth, insight, and relationship. She's also consulting editor of Psychoanalytic Inquiry, a clinical associate faculty member at the Chicago Center for Psychoanalysis, 
and a fellow of the Lauder Institute Global MDA, MBA program. She's published, presented, and been interviewed by the New York Times, NPR, and other national media on the value of psychotherapy, the therapeutic relationship and technology, and the public narrative about therapy. Welcome, Dr. Michaels. Well, thank you, Dr. Plake, and thank you so much. And thanks to the team at the Austin Riggs Center for sponsoring this event on such an important topic. And I really appreciate your, your words. And I, I'm so excited to hear about the success Riggs has had in operating according to its own terms and principles. Um, we're so grateful for your partnership in this event and also more broadly in our shared pursuit of access, appreciation, and fair reimbursement for depth therapy. Uh, just going to say a few words about Psychotherapy Action Network or Cyan, and then we'll get started. Um, as Dr. Plakin said, we're a grassroots nonprofit focused on advocating for those therapies of depth, insight, and relationship that create lasting change. We're committed to changing the public narrative about therapy, empowering professionals to stick up for the treatments they provide, and also supporting policies that advance access to this care. Our big tent has room for everyone, all disciplines, psychology, counseling, psychiatry, social work, marriage and family, um, and all theoretical orientations. We turned six this month, and we now have 5,000 individual members and over 80 organizational members, which includes the Austin Riggs Center. And this event itself is an example of how we like to do things at Cyan, in partnership and drawing from the best expertise we can. You'll see that the panelists we've assembled here today are the experts, and we're so honored that they also serve variously on our board, our steering committee, our advisory board, and our list of best friends in the mental health space. And now I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for tonight, Bevan Campbell. Bevan Campbell's idea is a psychologist treating couples and individuals in Brooklyn. She has a postgraduate certificate in couples therapy from Adelphi and is an advanced candidate at the William Allenson White Institute for Psychiatry, Psychoanalysis, and Psychology. She does so many things, I, I can't even keep track, but I will try. She teaches graduate students at NYU and Pace. She's a clinical supervisor for psychology doctoral candidates at Long Island University and Pace University. And with Cyan, she's the creator and the host of our Cyan Forum Live, a quarterly forum on issues that impact contemporary mental health care. Dr. Campbell's a consultant as well with the Academy of Community Behavioral Health, which is a partnership between the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health and the CUNY School of Professional Studies, where she designs and facilitates coursework on responding to grief and loss. Thanks all so much to all of you for being here today. And again, a special thanks to Dr. Plakin and Austin Riggs. And now, Bevan, take it away. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for that introduction. I'm just going to say a couple words briefly kind of to, to give you a sense of what we'll be covering tonight and also to tell you about the structure of the event. So some of you have may actually seen Linda present on science market research. Uh, we did a research project with the public where we talked to people, both people who'd never been in therapy and people who have some experience with therapy about their impressions, thoughts, feelings about therapy. And one of the findings, which is probably not very surprising to those of you in attendance tonight, is that most people cite cost and affordability as the reason that they don't seek treatment if they haven't sought out mental health treatment. Our research also indicated that even though 90% of our nationwide sample had health insurance, about a third were not really sure if mental health care was covered at all. Regarding insurance, there's a lot of misinformation and confusion for everyone involved, including therapists and other mental health providers. Treatments that focus on depth, insight, and relationship have particular challenges in navigating the world of third-party payers. The frequency and duration of our treatments can run afoul of the cost-saving measures employed by insurance companies, creating headaches for us as we try to advocate for our treatments. 
These days, many therapists are out of network altogether, often due to concerns about privacy, administrative hassles, and of course, low reimbursement rates. All of that fuels inadequate networks. This is a problem we are going to be talking about tonight. Those therapists who do work out of network may be more likely to get denials or requests for records or medical necessity reviews. One of the many examples that, as you've heard already, we still have not achieved full parity between mental health care and medical and surgical care. Insurance companies can still create many barriers for mental health treatment, especially when a clinician is out of network. The deaf therapist faces another challenge in that insurance companies explicitly favor short-term treatments that only address symptoms while using a distorted definition of evidence-based treatments and clinically insufficient standards of care. I'm sure I'm not the only person here tonight who has been asked by a peer at an insurance company what evidence-based treatment I was using, only to discover there was one acceptable answer that they were looking for. Tonight, we've brought together a panel of experts who work to fight for parity. They have used and created the laws to challenge insurance companies, and they develop tools to assist therapists, therapists in advocating for patients. We're going to be talking about both individual advocacy and mass advocacy, so how can we can assist our patients who are struggling to receive benefits to which they're entitled, but also how we as a field can work to make changes to advance access to care. So I'm going to tell you just a bit about the panel. Um, I, I'm sorry, rather about the events. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce our panelists. They're going to speak just briefly to give you a little, you know, sense of themselves and, and tell you about their expertise in this area. And then we're going to jump right into a panel discussion. And I've, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So that's going to be the bulk of our evening. But at any time during the event, you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. Um, we're going to about at eight o'clock, um, go to the Q&A. If you want to direct your question to a particular panelist, you know, you can indicate that. Otherwise, I'll give it to the full panel. Okay, so let's begin. I'm first going to introduce Mayram Bendat. Mayram is an attorney as well as a psychotherapist and founder of Psychopeel, the country's first mental health insurance law firm. With a background in law, clinical psychology, marriage and family therapy, and psychoanalysis, he serves as a consultant to national mental health advocacy organizations and frequently presents on access to treatment and mental health parity. He authored California's pioneering mental health law, SB 855, which has served as model legislation throughout the country. Mayram is a member of the American Psychoanalytic Association Advocacy Committee and a distinguished Idelson consultant to the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry. He has testified in Congress and state legislators and lectured at universities around the country, including Yale Medical School and Butler Hospital Brown University. He's been interviewed in the press and has published widely. Most recently, along with the Coalition for Psychotherapy Parity, he co-authored Clinical Necessity Guidelines for Psychotherapy, Insurance Medical Necessity, and Utilization Review Protocols for Mental Health Parity. Uh, we're very pleased you could be here tonight, Mayram, and we'll let you say hello. Thank you, Bevan. I very much appreciate the introduction. It's my privilege to be um, presenting tonight along with you. There seems to be an echo. Um, I'm hearing an echo. I don't know if it's possible to mute um, the background, but uh, it's a privilege to be here tonight. Um, I hope to be able to share some of my expertise regarding both uh, advocacy on an individual level um, and on a systemic level. And uh, I look forward to the questions that um, Bevan is going to field to us as a panel. Thank you so much. Okay, up next we have Catherine Kate Gallagher. She is a staff psychologist and psychoanalyst at the Austin Riggs Center and is also in private practice. She earned her PhD in clinical psychology from Georgia State University and is a graduate of the Austin Riggs Center Adult Psychoanalytic Training Program and fellowship in hospital-based psychotherapy. Her graduate re research primarily focused on understanding and preventing violence against women, a public health crisis rooted in gender inequality and issues of basic human rights. 
A full-time practicing clinician, Dr. Gallagher has shifted her attention to another significant human rights and equity issue, inadequate access to affordable mental health care. Dr. Gallagher is especially committed to supporting efforts to appeal insurer denials of medical necessity, mental health treatment. Thank you, Kate. So glad you could be here. Thank thank you, Bevan. Um, As Bevan said, I am a staff psychologist and psychoanalyst at the Austin Riggs Center. Um, In in addition to treating patients, a major part of my role at Riggs involves supporting clinicians and their patients in challenging adverse insurer uh, determinations primarily through writing appeal letters. Um, And when when I decided to pursue training and employment as a full-time clinician, I had to give up a deeply meaningful program of research. Advocacy is an important part of my personal and professional identities and my involvement in this research uh, or in this insurance work um, has allowed me to continue to fight for human rights as both or at both individual and systems levels. It is a privilege to be a staff psychologist at the Austin Riggs Center, and I am grateful to Dr. Plakin and my colleagues here this evening for for their tireless work in this often brutal arena, as well as for the ways they have supported my development so that I can support the development of others. Um, As part of tonight's offering, I will be providing a brief overview of the insurance templates that Dr. Plakin and I have constructed and made publicly available. You can download these materials via links on both the RIGS and Scion websites uh, with an option to email any questions or concerns you might encounter uh, through an associated portal. Um, And the goal here really is to offer something useful. Uh, So please do not hesitate to uh, use that function and be in touch if you end up having questions. And time permitting, um, I'm also going to hopefully uh, be able to offer some examples of the problematic insurer actions that we commonly encounter at RIGS so that we can collectively discuss how one might address these actions in an appeal letter, including uh, the potential legal implications involved. Thank you so much, Kate. Up next, I'm very happy to introduce Dee Brian Hufford. Described as one of the leading ARISA litigators in the country and one of the sharpest legal minds in this area of law by Chambers USA, Brian leads an innovative and nationally recognized practice representing patients and healthcare providers in high stake disputes with health insurance companies. His efforts have led to two of the largest recoveries ever obtained in ERISA based health insurance, cla- health insurance class actions and to a substantial collection of other precedent setting decisions that have transformed the rights of patients and providers, including with regard to behavioral health care and the Federal Parity Act. Brian has successfully argued health care appeals before the U.S. Court of Appeal for the second, third, fourth, and fifth circuits, and was lead counsel in two trials against Blue Cross Blue Shield entities on behalf of providers and provider associations. Brian is one of the one of only three attorneys recognized by Chambers USA in the ERISA litigation, mainly plaintiffs category, and is a law. 360 MVP for healthcare in 2015, 2016, and 2017, and benefits in 2019 and 2021. He was chosen as plaintiff attorney's trailblazer in 2017 and 2021 by the National Law Journal and has been recognized in industry rankings such as Bentmark litigation and super lawyers. Brian was the recipient of the 2021 Rona and Ken Purdy Award to End Discrimination from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. He is a member of the Federal Bar Foundation and the Kennedy Forum Legal Work Group and has published health law related opinion pieces in the Washington Post, CNBC, and many others. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Bevan. I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be here, especially with such a group of very um, important people who have played such an important role in the, in the behavioral health space. Um, I you know, head up the healthcare practice at my firm, Zuckerman Spader. I really sort of developed that practice, you know, started developing it back in the late 90s. Uh, not a whole lot of lawyers do this. I got involved really in the behavioral health space about 10 years ago, really when I, when I be- connected with uh, Mehram Bendad. And, and Mehram and I have been working together you know, for the last 10 years, really trying to, to expand this space. And the Witt case is a good example. Unfortunately, we didn't have the, the result at the, the last minute we wanted, but we're still hoping to, uh, to advance that. And we're really working hard on these things. One thing that's kind of interesting, a fact um, that a lot of people don't know is that I actually grew up in Western Kansas 
um, living on a campus of a residential treatment facility. My father was the executive director um, of that facility. Um, and my mother was the, a teacher there, basically running run room schoolhouse for the boys. About um, And I lived my entire life there. So I really was able to see the importance of that kind of service uh, provided to, to boys you know, who had emotional issues and difficult upbringings, et cetera. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we can help advance the law in parity and help, work, help provide information to all of you to help uh, you in, in pursuing your own careers. Thank you so much, Brian. All right, uh, next I'm going to be introducing David Lloyd. Uh, David Lloyd is the Chief Policy Officer at the Kennedy Forum. Mr. Lloyd is an expert, David rather, is an expert on a range of behavioral health policy issues, including insurance coverage and the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008. He has led successful state and federal policy initiatives, including enactment of nation-leading insurance legislation in California that have increased access to mental health and addiction care for millions of Americans. Mr. Lloyd also has expertise on budget and tax issues and previously served as a legislative assistant to U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow. He has a bachelor's in history from Cornell University and an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Thank you for being here tonight, David. Yeah, well, thank you, Bevan, and uh, thank you to Austin Riggs for hosting uh, a great and very important panel with uh, many, many people who have become close friends. Um, this is an extremely important issue. Uh, the Kennedy Forum was founded 10 years ago by former Congressman uh, Patrick Kennedy, who was the author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008. And so, you know, part of our um, you know, main reason for existing is ensuring mental health parity and ensuring that plans are following uh, the mental health parity requirements. And we've expanded beyond that in recent years um, to uh, put in place strong coverage standards relating to generally accepted standards in California, uh, also recently in Illinois and Oregon, um, that we hope to expand to uh, you know, other states because uh, you know, no American should be without um, adequate mental health and addiction treatment. Um, and certainly cost is a primary barrier uh, as Dr. Plankin uh, noted at the beginning of the panel. So thank you and uh, looking forward to having a robust discussion. Thank you, David. And now I'm gonna uh, just I'm gonna welcome add. Linda to speak. Um, I She already had an introduction, but Linda, um, just to uh, have you say hello again and talk a little bit about um, your uh, your role in all this. Yes, thanks, Bevan. Um, yeah, I'm here tonight um, now wearing two hats, both representing Cyan and also um, myself, I guess, as a psychologist in private practice. Um, at, at Cyan, as you know, we have a vision of the world where psychotherapies of depth, insight, and relationship are universally available to those in need. We know these therapies are evidence-based, and we know the evidence base shows that these therapies create lasting change. We also know the evidence base for short-term structured treatments shows a very different story, if not the opposite story, and it shows relapse and the need for more treatment. And unfortunately, in the public realm, and certainly with insurance companies, this narrative is completely inverted. Um, so there's a lot of work to do on achieving our vision and making it a, a reality in terms of educating the public, supporting policies such as parity, and helping professionals become better advocates for the work they do, which is what we're doing here tonight. Um, changing hats for a second, in my private practice, I am in network with insurance, even though I have a lot of philosophical conflicts about that. I don't like doing business with companies that have a business practice of shirking their obligations. And the fact that reimbursement to me has stayed the same for about the last 10 years. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I got a one penny increase in June. Um, that's essentially a big pay cut every year, um, which is not fair. Um, nor is it fair the amount of time it takes for a therapist and a patient to deal with these issues, to get coverage for what's defined in the insurance policy that the patient has already bought and paid for. There's a tremendous amount of outside session time for both of us to deal with the insurance companies and then precious in-session time. And I don't even wanna start thinking about issues of transference or enactments around all of this, um, but none of this administrative time or anxiety is medically necessary 
but it is what's required to provide the treatment and get paid. And sometimes I feel like I'm living in an alternate universe of catch-22 when insurance companies then send me letters asking if my care is medically necessary. So like everyone else here, um, I'm fired up and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Linda. All right, let's dive right in. So before I ask the first question, just a quick reminder for attendees at any time, please put your feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. We're gonna come back to them. So I, I want to start by asking a sort of a big picture question, because there's a lot of relevant laws uh, for us to discuss, and there's a lot of legislative background for us to discuss. But just to get the big picture, we know that when people need mental health or addiction services, too often their coverage, their health insurance plan is not going to provide the coverage that they need. And so just to give us a sense of what we're working towards, I want to ask all of you to speak to what are the aspects of good health insurance coverage for mental health and addiction services that should be in place and where do plans fall short? So what are we working towards? Well, I'm happy to. No, go ahead, David. If... Um, well, you, you definitely from the Kennedy Forum's you know, perspective, you know, all Americans should have access um, to affordable mental health and addiction coverage uh, when they need it um, on, on a timely basis. And you know, that means having um, as covered services under your health plan, you know, essentially every covered, every covered service, any covered service that you might need for mental health and addiction care, those services should be covered benefits. Um, oftentimes that's not the case. We see that there are big gaps in the continuum of services um, and many evidence-based services are simply not covered at all. Um, so that's that's kind of a foundational uh, issue. Uh, kind of a second core issue relates to network adequacy and making sure that there are an adequate number of in-network providers. And ultimately what matters to patients is whether there's timely and geographical, you know, geographic, uh, geographically accessible um, access to in-network uh, providers to provide the services they need. Um, so that's those having network adequacy standards um, is really is really critical. Um, a, a key part of that is network listings that are accurate. Um, we often see that that's not the case. There, it's often amazing that there's data that show shows that a majority of network um, you know entries uh, in network directories is inaccurate, which is just astounding. Um, and you know, so those those are you know really key elements. Is are can people are there covered services? You know, can are there enough providers available to provide those services? And then when people ultimately need the services, are they denied um, or are they approved as medically necessary? Um, and all all issues that we begin to touch on today, but those are certainly three critical aspects. There are additional ones, but uh, I'll let some of my other uh, you know colleagues uh, chime in. Uh, as well. But uh, you know, those, those definitely, I think, are foundational issues. Thank you, David. Mayor Ram, I know you're about to speak. When you do, could you also, um, I understand that network adequacy means, you know, colloquially, I don't have to call 15 providers and get zero callbacks or find out that those people aren't even living anymore or no longer practice. But is there a technical definition, a legal definition of network adequacy? Maybe you could say a little bit about that. Sure. So, um, sadly, there is not a federal uh, standard for what constitutes network network adequacy. Uh, it's a real um, uh, gap in terms of uh, coverage um, or access to coverage from a on a national level. And it's something that desperately needs to be tackled by Congress. Uh, there are, of course, states, that have implemented network adequacy standards, like in California. That's um, a state, for example, that's that says that if services can't be available or aren't available in network within a particular time uh, or within a particular geographic area, then insurers have to allow patients to access care um, outside of that network and do so in a way that they're not liable for anything beyond their in-network cost sharing. It's a very simple uh, kind of legislative fix to a, a um, really problem, a really problematic uh, area that that unfortunately results in a lot of care not being accessed nationwide. 
Um, and I just wanted to add one more thing to what David mentioned earlier, which is, of course, when we're talking about adequate insurance, and, and I suspect we'll hear from Brian as well on this, um, we're, we're talking about coverage that really evaluates treatment based on um, medical necessity standards that are adherent or consistent with generally what's generally accepted um, and not based on proprietary um, in-house baked uh, distortions of what um, professional standards are. And uh, that too is a real, um, uh, it, 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 it's an issue that is MIA in the federal context. There is no universal federal uh, definition of medical necessity or uh, generally accepted standards of care. It's something we litigated in WIT. Um, but again, some states have done a really good job at um, uh, adding um, very specific definitions uh, to their statutes and making them mandatory uh, for all carriers. And, and and thus the issue turns on whether those statutes get enforced properly. And we can talk about that as well and how mm. patients and providers can access enforcement. But I don't want to sidetrack too much right now. Thank you, Miriam. Brian, did you want to jump in? Yeah. The one, one thing that I would add, your question was sort of like, what coverage issues do we have and what problems do plans do we have with providing coverage? And I, I, in, from my perspective, looking at it as an attorney and, and challenging denials, et cetera, I don't think it's as much a problem with what the plans say, but it's how they're being applied. Because the plans generally do have language to provide coverage for behavioral health services. They, they're supposed to be covering medically necessary services. Usually the language is pretty standard. It's basically what's generally accepted in the medical community. You know, we don't see that many examples of, of plans that if read properly, don't actually provide or should provide the proper level of behavioral health care. The problem comes with the insurance companies or the TPAs, the third party administrators, and how they are interpreting those plans. Um, and in our view, that's really where the real issue is, is that they are the TPAs, more so than the employers, but the TPAs and um, are applying overly restrictive internal guidelines. Um, the network adequacy is a huge issue. We're gonna hear a lot of that tonight. Um, because they're not making these available and they're, and they're doing things to restrict coverage. And in a, in a way, the, the problem is it's somewhat easy. They found that it's easier to do that in behavioral health, I think, than medical surgical, because of the fact that it's not you know, a broken arm that you can show on, a, on an x-ray. There is some discretion involved in how you treat people with behavioral health, and they've taken advantage of that as a way to use medical necessity to restrict coverage and then also they're using these inadequate networks as a way to keep um, underpay because they'll, they, they don't pay the providers and that leads to providers not going in network and it makes, makes it much, much more difficult. So those are the big pictures we have to consider as we're evaluating what to do here and how to deal, deal with these problems. Thank you, Brian. I, I was wondering, Kate, if you could speak to that as someone who's sort of working in the trenches and you're trying to help you know, patients access care and Brian's talking about, well, maybe it's not, it's, it's that the, the guidelines as they're written aren't being followed. And I'm wondering if you have some examples of ways that insurance companies have um, denied treatment, you know, denied claims for treatment that really seem to, to um, at least at looking at them, either violate parity or perhaps violate the insurance company's own guidelines. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, we absolutely see that all the time. Um, insurance companies come up with all, you know, lots of clever ways of doing this. Either the patient is getting better and so they no longer need treatment or they aren't getting better fast enough. So they no longer need treatment. There, there is no middle ground and no way to win. Um, we encounter denials that uh, question our treatment as if uh, these insurance company reviewers know what's going on. Um, they have not evaluated the patient. They um, have not been uh, involved in the treatment and they are you know, constantly making claims that the patient needs to have a medication change or some, they need to be attending groups uh, more often or they put these stipulations in place as if they are the treating clinician. Um, and my understanding is there is nothing in the policy that says if you go 
towards A, then you must go towards B. You can't go from A to Z. And so they, they seem to make up their own rules as they go. And uh, more often than not, it, it's a, a way to push people out of treatment faster um, as a cost saving measure. Um, mm. And you know what? What I'll say about um, insurance policies is, I think, uh, practically speaking, it's important to know your insurance policy to really read it and understand it. Um, sometimes we see people who um, change insurance uh, providers prior to coming here, and they are excited and they think they have good coverage, and then it turns out they actually don't have coverage for an out-of-state, out-of-network facility, and they're shocked and, and really uh, quite upset. And it, it's typically in some kind of fine print that it, it says something that they did not see or understand. And so, you know, what I would recommend is, um, you know, these are tricky situations, and if you are in um, a difficult place, make sure you're seeking assistance from someone um, who can, you know, sit down with you and help you think through what would be the best coverage. Thank you so much, Kate. I, Linda, I wanted you to speak to this question as well about, you know, kind of the basics of what a plan should have. And I'm thinking about, you know, I know Sian has been very interested in telehealth and, and that issue. Could you, could you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, this present moment with telehealth, um, we at Cyan did a big push and supported um, coverage for telehealth sessions early on in the pandemic because there were actually not all insurance plans included benefits for um, telehealth visits. So that was critically important. Um, and we're concerned now because, uh, you know, telehealth is going to be here to stay, um, or at least hybrid practices will be. And what we're seeing now is we're seeing things like more cost sharing being transferred to patients. So um, people's copays going up. Um, we're having a lot of rumors and anxieties about will um, reimbursements in total go down for a telehealth session? And will insurance companies pay less for that than for an in-person session, um, even though it still takes an hour of time and the same amount of training and expertise? Um, will insurance companies, what we're also seeing now is some insurance companies saying, okay, if you wanna have a telehealth session, um, you can do so, but your therapist has to be not only in network with the insurance company, but in a sub network as well, um, something, for example, um, like an MD Live kind of sub network, um, which is further restrictive and intrusive um, and takes about 50% of the reimbursement payment that should be going to the therapist just for providing the video line and the billing. Um, so it's it's really, I think this is going to be the kind of the um, the brave new world where a lot of these issues of network adequacy um, and fair reimbursement are going to play out. Um, and then we have lots of questions of, um, centering on evidence-based care and what that means and who gets to define that, as the panelists have already said, um, with additional examples coming up of new companies such as Lyra Health, which says explicitly, we only provide evidence-based care and we actually refuse to hire any therapists who provide depth therapy whatsoever. Um, so this is very problematic um, and talk about companies coming up with their own idiosyncratic mm -hmm. definitions of, of evidence-based care. Um, but this is another big problem that we see going on right now. Thank you, Linda. Be before I, I jump to the next topic, I just want to let people know there's actually a Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. So if you don't mind, um, rather than putting in the chat, putting your question or comments in the Q&A, just that way I won't miss them at the end because the chat's going to get very filled, I think. So I, I want to talk a bit about the legislative background because I know when we think about advocacy and, and adv advocacy on a larger scale, one thing we're thinking about is what is the legislation that we want to have in place to ensure that people have access to the care that they need and that plans are covering what they need to be covering? And so I, I wanted to, to ask about that and, and some, you know, in particular, some recent significant court cases that might be sort of model legislation. 
So many attendees have likely heard of the landmark federal court case, WIT versus, WIT versus United Behavioral Health. You've heard that mentioned tonight. It addressed many of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, the WIT ruling first came in 2019 and found that UHC was inappropriately making coverage decisions based on its own criteria. Its financial team was driving the decisions, even overruling United's own clinicians. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Brian and, and Mayram. Can you give us an update on why this case has been important and what its status is right now? Sure, I'll give a summary, but Mayram, you should feel free to jump in. Um, you know, the case was very critical and it really was recognized throughout the country when it came in, in part because we were really focusing on how insurance companies are interpreting what is medically necessary. At the beginning, Eric was sort of discussing, you know, gave some summaries and he was a very important part of the case, providing expert testimony um, about how insurance companies um, early on were, were, the, were the problem was they were imposing limitations to only cover um, critical stages um, when somebody's in an acute phase rather than actually addressing the chronic underlying conditions and treating the overall uh, condition as you would basically do any other time you are um, uh, you know, getting medical surgical treatments, et cetera. And that's really what we focused on is that, is that we found that United Healthcare was using its own internal guidelines that were geared for just covering acute phase. So if somebody's actively suicidal, if they are um, you know, in, in almost need to be in a hospital, we're going to treat you, but then as soon as you're basically no longer acute, you're getting ready to be kicked out, even though what we're not letting you do is get appropriate levels of care. Now, a lot of that was in sort of residential treatment, but it also in included just uh, therapy where we'd see people where insurance companies would come up and say, well, you're seeing somebody uh, once a week. Well, you really only need it once every two weeks. So maybe you need it once a month. And then we had examples where they said, we're not going to cover anything going forward. We don't think you need any more therapy. And just the idea of an insurance company being able to decide that they don't need, need uh, therapy um, is, is absurd. Now, we got an incredible decision. Our judge really focused on those issues. And with our experts, we were able to show that, in fact, United was putting its financial needs ahead of the patients, and that it, in fact, was relying on guidelines that were directly contrary to generally accepted standards. In, in a surprise to all of us, the, the district, the um, Ninth Circuit reversed the decision in a very strange way. It's a very short opinion. It was called a memorandum opinion, so they didn't even wasn't a normal published opinion, but it was only like seven pages and literally one page on the reversal. It did not reject any of those basic holdings. It didn't say that United was not putting its financial incentives ahead of its patients. It did not say that United's guidelines were not uh, inconsistent with general accepted standards. All the primary holdings were not touched at all. All the, the Ninth Circuit basically held was, well, United under its plans is in fact entitled to adopt guidelines that are inconsistent with general accepted standards. So it basically gave them a free free reign. Now we filed a motion for reconsideration um, and for what's called on banc review to try to get the entire panel to look at that. It's been, I, I think, eight or nine months now since that's been fully briefed. We've not heard word from the, from the court. That's very unusual. Usually they respond pretty quickly. The vast majority of these are dismissed uh, pretty early. So we have some hope that something will come from it. But the more important issue in, in many ways is the decision is still out there, notwithstanding how we got hurt, by this Ninth Circuit decision, the basic findings in the court about what are generally accepted standards, and that's a critical factor, our judge actually listed eight standards of which these are generally accepted standards of care. That is still a holding, that's not been reversed. And moreover, Mayram, and, and I'd like him to talk more about that, has used that to help, that's what the California law, for example, 855, directly adopted and codified the holdings of WIT. And so the decision is really having an impact notwithstanding where we are right now, and we're hoping to continue uh, pushing it forward. Um, and so we'll see where, where it goes. Miram, do you wanna to add to that? Sure, so um, uh, as Brian mentioned, um, the, the meat of wit, so to speak, the, the uh, holding about what generally accepted standards are, uh, which medical necessity um, guidelines uh, developed by which clinical associations constitute generally accepted standards, that is still valid. And in California, it's the law. Um, and it's the law, not just with respect to United, but with respect to every insurance company. Um, and frankly, um, not only is it the law in California, it's now the law also in uh, Illinois and in Oregon, uh, where the Kennedy Forum has been particularly helpful in getting the legislation passed. 
Um, and um, most recently, even states uh, like Georgia have uh, enacted legislation to broaden the definition of medical necessity to encompass generally accepted standards of care. So uh, I actually feel very good about um, about the impact of WIT, uh, regardless of what happens on appeal, um, WIT is about one company's insurance guidelines. We've got state laws that now address every single insurer's guidelines, and there's no wiggle room uh, for uh, whether they get to use the uh, medical necessity standards developed by nonprofit professional associations rather than by their own finance departments or um, uh, in internal people. Uh, I will say that um, with respect to um, what was happening also with United is that not only were these guidelines being used for outpatient psychotherapy, but in another case that Brian and I brought, we challenged United's use of its um, uh, alert program, which basically um, uh, Call, is, is essentially uh, led United to make these medical necessity determinations months in advance of, um, of, of treatment. So in other words, a patient would be seen for outpatient psychotherapy, United would review the case and then determine what the patient needed for the next six to 12 months, which is just uh, hard to, to, to fathom in the outpatient context. It's not an inpatient scenario where things change day by day, potentially. Um, so, so at the same time, things can change day by day. And if you're making decisions um, uh, months in advance of, of, of these changes, then you could be missing out on some really critical information. Ultimately, uh, the Department of Labor came in and um, uh, got United to stop applying its alert program. And so it's not making prospective decisions anymore about outpatient treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a really um, big, uh, I think, um, achievement for a regulator and for the, the, the mental health space. Um, and of course, I, I do think we should, and I'm sure you'll ask, Evan, uh, how we engage regulators um, to, to uh, work with us, but, but essentially the WIT case um, as well as some preceding cases that we worked on really led to some changes in terms of these prospective reviews for psychotherapy and also about the standards that are applied with respect to psychotherapy. And frankly, I hear very little complaints about United right now with respect to their outpatient psychotherapy cases. I wanted to ask David a follow-up question about what you just said, Mayram. Before I do, I just want to mention our, our Q&A is on fire. People have a lot of questions, so I'm going to move us kind of brisk, briskly along because I want to make sure we can answer as many possible. But David, I know the Kennedy Forum you know, successfully enacted that legislation that Mayram mentioned, and I wondered, can you tell us a little bit, is there a push in other states for similar legislation? Where does that stand? Yeah, we, we, we certainly hope so that this will be expanded. I mean, the legislation in California was that was an that was then enacted in Illinois and Oregon. Um, the California requirements are that health plans have to cover all medically necessary treatment. Um, and it's a pretty expansive mandate under California law. Um, and it also puts in place a strong definition of medical necessity um, that is not stacked in the health plan's favor, that if the, you know, if the patient uh, meets the requirements of the medical necessity definition, the care has to be covered. Um, so that's kind of a second you know, key component. Um, a third key component, which actually ties into the medical necessity definition, is that all medical necessity determinations have to be consistent with generally accepted standards of care. You're know, bringing in the WIC case. Um, the WIC case is kind of also, at least the findings of the WIC case, um, are also brought in um, by requiring that only uh, nonprofit professional association criteria can be used. Um, so things like the ACM criteria, um, the locus, the level of care utilization system for mental health conditions, um, those are the criteria that are mandated under California law now, which is enormously, uh, enormously powerful. Um, and then kind of, uh, uh, there are a number of other provisions, but the other you know, key provision, which we're actually working on right now is you know, California has timely access standards, uh, for routine appointments. It's 10 days for mental health appointments. 
And if in-network services are not avail available within those timely access standards, the health plan under the uh, bill, uh, uh, SB 855, has to arrange out-of-network coverage and limit the, the enrollee to in-network uh, cost sharing. And if the plan fails to do so, the enrollee is able to arrange the out-of-network care themselves and be limited to the in-network uh, you know, cost sharing. And the health plan must reimburse uh, you know, the remainder, whatever the difference between the charged amounts and the uh, in-network cost sharing is. So it's actually quite powerful. And I think that's where um, you know, a key insight for us is that you have to have accountability and you have to have consequences if the rules aren't being followed. Um, and so that's what we tried to do um, through SB 855 in California. Uh, after that bill was enacted, we renamed it the Ramstad uh, model uh, legislation named after Jim Ramstad, who was co-author with Patrick Kennedy of the Mental Health Care and Addiction Equity Act. Um, and we're ho hoping that more, more and more states will adopt it. And that uh, you know, ultimately the federal government needs to adopt these standards as well. Yeah, no, I, I think- I think something that is um, a bit discouraging, at least from my perspective, is you know even when a co when a company is using something like the Locus, which falls within generally accepted standards, what we see is they then misuse the Locus. So they'll approve, for example, 21 days of coverage, and then we get a denial letter saying uh, that the patient does not meet medical necessity uh, based on the Locus, and then they list. Um, their idea of what the locus criteria are, which is often wrong, and then they say nothing else. And so they don't, they fail to discuss um, why that specific patient's clinical needs uh, do not uh, match up with the criteria they're using, which is, you know, a big problem and it makes it difficult to appeal. And as, essentially the, the tactic we take is, um, you know, they, they used uh, the locus in a, in a flawed manner. Like this is not, um, they're not actually, they're abusing the locus. This is not consistent with generally accepted standards. It's uh, basically applying the same old proprietary guidelines only with a mask on that says locus. So um, it, it's incredibly frustrating to see this continual misuse of um, all of these efforts to try to do the right thing by the patients that, um, you know, the, these companies are, are supposed to serve. And, and so, Kate, the appeals letters that, that you've, you know, created with others at Austin Riggs, it sounds like one thing you have in mind is speaking to this issue of what is medical necessity and are the standards of care being used by the clinician appropriate and generally accepted standards of care? Absolutely. I, I would add that part of what makes WIT and the statutes in California, Illinois, Oregon so important is that while it is true that insurers can always misapply any standard, at least with respect to recourse in terms of complaining to a regulator or seeking an external review or filing a lawsuit, at least then there is no fight about what the correct standard is. There may be a fight about a standard having been misapplied, but it's a much easier fight to win than having to prove to a court from the get-go what the correct standard should have been. So while I certainly wouldn't leave it past insurers to misapply standards, um, you know what we need to be doing collectively is ensuring that our state regulators and our federal regulators have robust external appeal systems um, that, that actually um, apply the standards correctly. And of course, that, that state regulators and, and federal regulators insist that insurers are actually trained in, in the use of the correct standards and don't just distort them willy-nilly at their convenience. So I, I have a question related to network advocacy, uh, inadequacy rather. Um, David, you mentioned the legislation that would compel insurance companies to pay for out-of-network treatment if they don't provide adequate networks. And, and I want to talk about how that relates to, because I mean, the, of course, you know, it's, un, it's unavoidable to talk about the fact that networks are inadequate because often providers are not paid rates that they feel are sustainable. And so, you know, it's, it's a huge problem. And I know so many people I've talked to just ha have struggled so much to find in-network providers. And so I'm wondering, 
what is the recourse? Is it through legislation like the one you're describing? Can other people speak to that? Can we do anything about these ghost panels, the inadequate yeah. networks? I mean, there certainly needs to be much more aggressive enforcement of the federal parity rules. Um, the federal parity rules have not, uh, at least yet, been very been effectively used for the most part, um, with one notable exception that Miram and Brian were involved with, um, you know, relating to reimbursement reimbursement rates. Um, in California, we are hoping that our legislation puts upward pressure on reimbursement rates um, because the health plan is on the hook for providing the out of network providing the out of network service and having a network exception um, and limiting the enrollee to in network cost sharing, and they have to pay the difference. Um, and so that I think can be painful for health plans when they're used to paying. Uh, you know, very, very inadequate uh, rates. So hopefully they will see that it's within their interest to bring more, uh, you know, more providers into networks. Now, obviously reimbursement is only one piece of the, of why, you know, insurers don't want, why providers don't want to join insurer networks. Uh, things like medical necessity denials, um, you know, all the paperwork, all the um, rigmarole that, uh, you know, that providers have to go through. Um, insurers also need to address that. Some of those can be addressed um, through aggressive enforcement of the Parity Act, um, but definitely we have to give uh, you know, providers and patients recourse when the networks aren't adequate so that uh, health plans actually feel some pain uh, mm -hmm. in having to arrange care uh, when they're not meeting their obligations. Thank yeah, you so much. I, we'll go I, ahead, I think, yeah, I'm, I think this is such an important part of these new laws, and I think we really have to focus on educating therapists what to what the recourse is if you know we run into patients who are not able to find an in-network provider as David is explaining um, because it's it's these consequences we we have to push on them it's these consequences that are going to ultimately force the insurance companies and will make a difference and um, I would I would just add to what Linda said the recourse though is going to vary based on where the insurance policy has been issued. So um, if, if Linda is seeing a patient from California with a California policy, she may have very different recourse for that patient uh, than for a patient who is uh, coming from uh, some other state that doesn't have a robust network adequacy law and, and recourse written into it. So I, I again wanna stress that this is an area where listeners to today's panel discussion could really get involved in a more collective fashion to lobby their state legislatures, to work with the Kennedy Forum and, and uh, other consumer groups to bring about state changes that, that actually expand access to care along these lines. So we have 33 questions in the Q&A. Before, I really wanna jump into it, but before we do, Linda, can you talk about the toolkit that we put together for this event? Oh, sure. Yeah, I think the link has been put in the chat and, and hopefully um, it can be emailed out afterwards. But yes, we have a toolkit. Um, it's housed on the Cyan website and I believe also on the um, Austin Rig Center website. Basically, it has um, a section describing a lot of what we've been talking about here, the background of the um, WIT uh, case, the state laws, parity, common parity violations, et cetera, kind of a lot of the background um, concepts we've been talking about. It has a section on um, advocating with the public and using the media to do so. We've had some good luck getting some um, journalists to cover this important issue. When you Also, when you have a patient that can talk to a journalist, they're particularly interested in those stories. Um, a number of us actually on the panel also um, provided a lot of content to John Oliver for a show that he did this past summer on mental health, um, or should I say skewering the insurance industry. And um, so that was a fun way to get a lot of complex content out there as well. Um, and then we have a lot of templates, um, uh, many of them thanks to Kate and, and Dr. Plakin, um, appeal letter templates, medical necessity letter templates, instructions for filing complaints, 
Um, and then a resource section with links to um, a super detailed and comprehensive toolkit that the Kennedy Forum and NAMI put together and some other toolkits that are out there with a lot more detail as well and, and a lot of articles. Um, so it's, um, yeah, definitely something to check out that we're published along with this event. Thank you, Linda. Okay, uh, the q and I think is gonna uh, get us right into um, some other areas that I think people are really interested in. Our first question, and this is gonna go for our lawyers on the panel, I believe, from Joseph Feldman. Do obligations created by parity laws include reimbursement schema? That is, if medical surgical reimbursement rates are increasing and mental health care services aren't, are those legal violations? That's in some ways the million, hundred million, billion dollar question. Um, for, for network adequacy, I really do think the reimbursement should be, and, and, and it's really an open question of how much it is. But in my view, you, the, the reason why you, the network adequacy, inadequacy, and reimbursement go hand in hand. The reason why we have inadequate networks for behavioral health is in many ways because they pay so little for in-network behavioral health specialists. And as a result, far more of those people do not take uh, insurance at all. And it's because of the reimbursement. One issue that I've been talking to, and I'm talking to Mayron about this, is the idea of trying, if we could identify patients who basically say, I couldn't find an in-network provider, therefore I'm going out of network and they're paying more money, that person theoretically could have standing to pursue a parity claim. And our argument would be that in fact does represent a parity violation. I don't want to say it's a, it's a sure thing, however, because it's not like there's precedent out there in that issue. Um, my argument would certainly be it is a parity violation, but the response from the insurance companies is going to be, as long as we follow the same process and we apply market forces, you know, that's going to, in the same way, there's no parity violation, even if it leads to underpayment of, of, for behavioral health. But of course, the response is, you're obviously not applying market forces if that leads to far worse networks for behavioral health. Because what that means is you're paying more for medical than you are for, for, uh, you know, for behavioral health. And that's shown by a lot of studies. I mean, the Milliman study that people may, may have heard about and others have shown that the percentage of people going out of network in behavioral health is far more. Moreover, if you, can, if you use Medicare as a, as a comparison and Medicare, uh, one area of the law needs to change, it doesn't require parity and it itself is discriminatory. But if you apply Medicare as a, as a comparison, the medical surgical in-network rates are far higher in comparison than behavioral health. And so that I think is good evidence about this parity violation that we need to look into. Um, Mayor, I want you to discuss your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. I, I would just add that that's why I'm more, I tend to favor more straightforward standard that says that if a patient cannot access care within X time or Y distance, then they should be entitled to seek out of network care at the in-network cost sharing and the insurer should be on the hook for everything else. Because at the end of the day, what the insurers are doing are selling us a promise of coverage. They're saying these are covered services, at least the ones that they claim to be are covered should be covered and people should have access. And if they don't, then it shouldn't become the financial burden of the patient. And I feel like we've potentially set ourselves up a little bit for disappointment by, um, just noting how difficult it is to enforce parity. And I think um, a, a, an easy solution would be to say, well, there's a straightforward standard and it could apply to both medical and mental health in equal fashion, same time standard, same distance standards. If you can't arrange it, you obviously don't have an adequate network and you've got to kind of cover it. There's one, one caveat with that that, you know, that we've got to think about too is, I've seen several examples recently where, where patients, some of these were behavioral health, some were medical, couldn't find out of network. So they were allowed, couldn't find in network. So they, were, they went out of network and the insurance company said, we'll treat that as if it's in network for your copay, your kosher uh, insurance and your deductibles. But they didn't treat it for the difference between the bills and allowed amount. So in a sense, they would say, well, your deductible is gonna be the same as in network. Your 20% copay will be the same, but yet you're still on the hook. Yeah. the difference between billed and allowed. And if that's the case, then it doesn't help to treat you as a as network. And yeah. that's something that has to be clear. I think David has one, a statute he's working on that tries to make that to deal yeah. with. The, the California law, um, it says that the enrollee shall pay no more than the in-network uh, you know, in amount as if they 
had received the network, the services in the network. So essentially it, it caps it and it, the interpretation has the right, correct interpretation uh, has been that that means that the health plan has to pick up the balance. And, and, and that needs to be broader, including on the federal level. I'll just on one other quick thing. One problem is so much of this really has to be done federally because if you're a self-funded plan, state laws don't apply at all. And the insurance companies want to be in self-funded. United Healthcare, 80% of its commercial business is self-funded. Cigna, 85% is self-funded. That means they recognize the bulk of their business and where they make a lot of profits is simply being the middleman in, in large employers where state laws don't apply to them. So trying to get this done on a federal level and maybe getting the Department of Labor more active with regulations is critical. The problem on legislation, it's hard to get any legislation passed at the federal level these days. Um, but, but that's something we have to keep in mind as well. I'm going to move us along to make sure we, we get to the next one. And, and Kate, I think this might be something you could speak to because we're actually getting quite a few questions about um, treatments of more frequent than once a week duration and how we justify medical necessity under these circumstances. And if an insurance company um, is um, asking us what makes this a medically necess necessary treatment? And I know you have worked on these templates of appeal letters. Can you speak to that? Like how in-depth therapy treatments, how you can demonstrate medical necessity, what you need to talk about in terms of um, pushing back if services are denied? Yeah, absolutely. Let me paste, I'm trying to paste something into the chat for folks. Um, doesn't seem to be working. Um, let me try this again. Uh, so I, I guess um, the main thing I would recommend is look at the resources that we have available. And like, um, yeah, my, my paste is not working for some reason, but um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to paste in the, um, the uh, eight principles of effective treatment that reflect generally accepted standards of care, which um, were identified um, by uh, Judge Spiro in the WIT verdict. Um, and like I believe Mayram talked about earlier, um, we, we obtained those, uh, those principles from WIT, but the, the judge didn't make these up. Um, he, took them from underlying documents. He took them from expert testimony, like Dr. Plakin's testimony, um, and reviewed uh, published guidelines that reflect generally accepted standards within our field. So essentially, these eight standards belong to clinicians, as I see it. These are ours, and uh, they do not, uh, the insurance company, from my perspective, is not allowed to determine what is effective and what is not. And so what I would recommend is review these standards and, and arguing uh, the specifics of the case. I need to see the patient more frequently because this person um, has uh, underlying um, conditions. They have a, a serious trauma history. There's chronicity here. They have failed treatment at lower levels of care. Once a week treatment has not been effective. Um, they're not able to make use of of outpatient uh, treatment because they cannot manage themselves in between the sessions. They have comorbid factors like uh, serious medical conditions or substance abuse conditions. Um, you know, there, there are environmental factors like, it, you know, they don't have a safe home to, to be in. So they leave my office and they go back to um, you know, a problematic home environment that doesn't is not conducive to treatment. And so I would recommend really arguing the specifics of the, the patient's case and why under generally accepted standards, this patient requires the treatment that you are recommending and to take up your authority as the clinician. You are the treating clinician. You are the expert on that patient. And I would also encourage people to, to um, have their patients advocate for themselves, have their patients call the insurance company, have their patients write their own letters in support of their treatment. Uh, we have seen pretty good luck with that in terms of, uh, you know, the patient is the, the person who has the policy, they have the legal contract with the insurance company, and that insurance company should listen to that, uh, that member. And I, I really like, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, 
insurance denials are often seen as a, a you know, a, a crisis in the treatment that can detract from treatment. And I would encourage people to see it a little bit differently and use it as an opportunity to actually uh, bring it into the treatment and engage it with the patient, help the patient, uh, you know, take up their own authority and, and really work to manage, uh, you know, a crisis and learn from that crisis. We know as clinicians that a crisis can bring opportunities for development and learning and, you know, they have you in their corner to support them and that can go a long way. Um, so that, that would be my sort of long answer to a, a quite complicated question. That's really helpful. Thank you, Kate. We have a very uh, provocative question from Joel Cantor. Has there been any malpractice complaints filed against peer reviewers working for insurers? Anyone able to speak to that or know if that is a way to uh, push hmm. back? It generally doesn't work because... Okay. I'm sure there have been complaints, but but you mean actual litigation? My understanding is that usually those things get bounced because the courts view insurers not as actual treating providers, but as as um, essentially making cover de coverage decisions. That said, um, uh, I know that Dr. Plakin has been active with the American Psychiatric Association to um, uh, bring into focus uh, greater scrutiny of this type of behavior from an ethics perspective. Um, and so the question might be um, posed to him in terms of where do professional associations like the American Psychiatric Association stand um, with respect to holding medical directors accountable for ethical lapses, because there are ethics responsibilities mm -hmm. From physicians, um, so so um, separate question to be, to be uh, discussed with Dr. Blaken. Thank you, Brian. You started to speak to this question, but Judy Gallant asked, "Can you talk about what coverage is actually held to parity law and which covered is not?" Now, I know there are a few different laws that speak to parity, but I think the question is, what types of plans are subject to what laws? I don't know if there's a, that's probably a very broad question, but I don't know if there's a way we can sort of speak to that. Yeah, I mean, actually, I might, I might defer, defer to Mayram on that, because I bet he's got, he probably has a better, uh, a quicker response to it, because it, it definitely covers, I mean, ERISA, it, it, it covers all the ERISA plans, which are commercial private employer plans, it covers, but it does not cover, um, for example, Medicare. Um, but then the ACA is expanded to beyond uh, ERISA plans. And, and, and of course, there's also various state laws that have good parity. But Mayor, I want you to provide a summary because you probably. Yeah, yeah, no, I think you got it, Brian. I, I mean, it's basically um, uh, applicable to the majority of commercial plans or just about all commercial plans, um, uh, whether they're individual or uh, group plans. Uh, but it doesn't apply to um, uh certain plans like the federal employee health benefit plan uh, or Medicare or um, some of the governmental uh, employee plans. Um, they have uh, protections through other ways, uh, but not directly through the parity statute. Um, and and uh, I know David is kind of uh, working on that as well. Maybe you want to say something, David. Yeah, I mean, it's primarily Medicare, uh, traditional Medicaid, fee-for-service Medicaid is not under the Parity Act. TRICARE um, is not directly. Um, all of this needs to be needs to be fixed. Um, we actually just closed a major gap for um, self-funded non-federal government plans, so state and local plans. Congress just uh, passed legislation uh, that was enacted at the end of last year to end the ability of those plans to opt out mm -hmm. of the Federal Parity Act. Um, the city of Chicago is one of them, um, and Linda played a very prominent role in helping us uh, by giving an interview to the New York Times, um, which ultimately kind of kicked things off and resulted in Congress actually, you know, closing the loophole, which affects probably roughly a million Americans in you know state and local government, uh, state and local government plans, uh, in, and their family members, the public employees' family members in those plans as well. So essentially, this is the last year. The, the current plan year for each of the plans is the last year that they can opt out the federal period. Yeah, could could I also just oh, talking about the parity issue? Could I maybe? Um, I know Brian, you've spoken about the, um, and I think there's a question about this in the chat. Speaking to this too, the differential between um, 
what different disciplines are paid for the same service. MDs are paid at 100%, psychologists at 85%, or I think I, sh I should know that as a psychologist. And, um, but, and, and is there a potential parity violation um, baked into that system? Well, we, we had, a, um, had a case, uh, Miriam and I had a case um, against United that had, they basically had a policy that said, we have a standard way we're gonna pay out of network. Some plans say it's gonna be uh, you know, fair health or, or using uh, usual customary rates, some are Medicare rates, but they said, but if it's behavioral health and you're a psychologist, we're gonna have an automatic 25% reduction. And if you're a social worker, an automatic 35% reduction. And our argument was that's a parity violation. It also didn't make a whole lot of sense. For example, in fair health, which theoretically gathers all the charges out there, the vast, vast majority of charges that they're gathering for like therapy, for example, are, are psych uh, psychologists and social workers, not psychiatrists. And so it didn't make any sense to be um, to making that adjustment anyway. But we actually got a settlement. We ended up working with the New York Attorney General's office and the DOL and got a settlement to have them change that policy. Um, they're now complying with Medicare. The problem, and Medicare no longer has any discrepancy with psychologists, but they still have a, I believe it's 20% is that right there, um, for the- 25. For, for social workers, um, which we don't think really should be there either, but that's still with, it, it's harder, much harder to challenge since, since it is in Medicare. So we were able to make some progress there, but I do think that's an issue that has to be, um, you continued looking at. Um, you know, especially when you're looking at, at, at the kind of treatment, because you know, it's like, uh, we don't want to create internal conflicts for behavioral health providers, but you know, um, the way the coding works, and, and Mayor can speak a lot to this, but, but you know, uh, uh, psychiatrists don't just have billing for uh, you know, seeing patients, but they also you know, do have separate billing for the medication management and, and other ways to, to bill, other ways that they bill, um, whereas uh, where psychologists you know, don't have that. And so there are other ways that, 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 that a psychologist, psychiatrist, for example, will be paid more. Um, and if, if you're just looking straight at therapy, for example, in our view, there shouldn't be that discrepancy. Um, and that's something that our case looked at, but, it's, it, but again, it's an issue that needs to be evaluated. Miriam, do you want anything more on that issue? No, I, I think that that's, again, um, part of the problem is that we don't, have, we don't have state laws, we don't have federal laws that say how reimbursement ought to be set. There is no national benchmark that obligates plans to pay anything. And so they get to create their own rules and they of course make them very cryptic. And some plans basically are so vague that they tell you that the allowed amount is what we set. <laughs> that's, and that's the end of it. So, so uh, you know, it, we've got a long way to go with that. There's a question in the chat about litigation. Uh, Rosa Holstein is asking, in litigation, in what instances can a clinician be the plaintiff? I, I want to expand that question and see if you could speak to litigation in this area in a more general way. What kinds of instances, what kinds of denials of care, what kinds of violations of parity um, might be potential um, sources of litigation? And, and as Russell's asking also, is that something a clinician is ever involved in or is that only the uh, insured party? In, in an ERISA context, and this is probably true elsewhere as well, but ERISA, for example, and we've been using that word a lot, it's, it's the federal statute that governs private uh, commercial litigation. It stands for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And it basically addresses all welfare benefit plans, um, including health insurance. Um, it's designed really for patients um, and, and, and for beneficiaries and participants of the language that it uses for the, for the insured patients. Providers can sue and represent, and represent the patients in appeals or in lawsuits, but they have to be authorized to do that. So for example, to do an appeal under ERISA, and this is a critical you know, for providers to understand, they need to be designated by the patient as the authorized representative. That's sort of the term of art under ERISA. If the patient designates the provider as the authorized representative to pursue appeals on behalf of the patient. And then the litigation, um, similarly, they can be an authorized representative and be, be um, basically giving an assignment to allow the provider to sue. But there's caveats to that because many plans now have what are called anti-assignment clauses where they say you can't assign the claim and that blocks providers from being able to sue. So what we do with a lot of our clients is we have them do um, not, not just um, an assignment, 
but, at, but actually have you get a, a power of attorney to allow the, the provider to step in the shoes of the patient and to, and to sue on, on behalf of the patient. Um, that we've done that many times with, with, with cases, but I'll also add frequently we work with providers to get patients themselves or their families as the, as the, uh, the, the plaintiffs. And many ways that's the better route to go. That doesn't mean they're always gonna get there, but the defenses are, are lower. It's, it's easier legally to bring the case if we're gonna do a case on behalf of a patient than on behalf of a provider. Thank and you. I, I so should just add that there's also the situation with in-network providers. That's yes. a little bit different. The in-network providers, of course, have their own standing, but their remedies are limited by whatever network agreements they have signed. And usually people forget what they've signed uh, or don't pay attention to anything other than the rates at the time of signing and don't notice, for example, that they can't go to court, that they have to arbitrate their claims, that they can't allege class claims, that they have to litigate individual claims. And of course, uh, worse yet, that there are no attorney's fees for successful recovery, and beyond that, no punitive damages for misconduct by health plans. So the whole in-network provider process has all sorts of built-in um, disincentives for network providers to sue. And of course, they can't enforce the parity law under their network agreements because that's a statute. It's not... Um, uh, a contractual right. And so courts or arbitrators aren't going to be able to enforce any uh, parity mm. claims. And, 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 the, and that's actually why almost always we represent patients or out of network providers. We rarely represent in network providers for that very reason. When you have the arbitration clauses, it's so restrictive that, it'd be, that it's very, very difficult um, you know, to do that. That's why if we're working with in network providers, we try to then see if they can give us access and maybe get the, the plaintiff, the patient. Uh, you know, to, or the families to come on board. So I want to speak to some, you know, people in the chat talking about really wanting to take away from this the tools, the next steps for action, and and I can start. I want to start with you, Linda, on on an individual level. Can you speak to so when our patients are dealing with insurance company issues like these inadequate networks or capricious coverage denials? Um, can you talk about what are some tools that clinicians can access? What are next steps? How can the toolkit help them? How can the um, appeal letters, appeal letters rather that Kate has been talking about help them? Can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, it's um, yeah, great question. And I, you know, I, 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 just what you said, I mean, there are a lot of um, tools uh, in the toolkit for use. And I think um, one of the things that the most empowering thing therapists can do, I think, is get educated and equipped with these tools. Um, I actually was working with a patient. We had a number of, of treatment denials and um, and I consulted at first informally with Mayram and um, the patient had written a letter, um, an appeal letter, and Mayram said, well, this is not a good letter. Um, and so I had to get educated myself on what makes for a good letter and what needs to be included. And I didn't know um, all of those components. And so um, I needed to get educated on that. And also what David was speaking to, um, the article in the New York Times that did focus on the city of Chicago opting out of parity. Um, that has been a huge topic on the listservs in Chicago, and lots of therapists are very angry about that, but you could tell they didn't really understand that this was the city of Chicago making a decision to um, take advantage of a loophole that they, it was entitled to take advantage of if it wanted to. Um, people were really angry at the, uh, you know, the company where that would call up therapists and 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 do the pre-authorizations and stuff like that but therapists didn't really understand you know what was driving that or or that that was a a result of of what the city of chicago did and what kind of insurance policy the city of chicago had for its own employees of course the first responders in our pandemic um, our police, our firefighters, our teachers. Um, so I think to really, you know, do some of your own research on these issues, um, to use the letters and the templates in the toolkit. Um, and I think also, you know, to um, try to also educate your patients 
um, you know, who's buying these insurance plans? Uh, the companies. That's where patients work. They're employers. Those are the customers. Um, so to educate your patients to go to their HR departments and say, you know what? This telehealth coverage that we have right now, this is ridiculous. My therapist is not in MD Live, will never join MD Live. Why is that a part of our plan? Um, and complain to HR departments who are purchasing these plans. Um, so I think to think systemically about what's going on and to also educate yourself as a therapist about the issues and the tools that are available. Um, I think that's what I would would recommend. Thank you, Linda. And and where should we putting be putting our efforts uh, as a field? Is it is it about pushing for legislation? Um, are there thoughts on that? Well, we have to. We, Go we, ahead. We, <laughs> we have to do it. Uh, we have to push for legislation because we have again a hodgepodge of laws around the country, and and yet we are at a critical point in our. Um, place as a nation where mental health um, disorders, substance use are uh, at an all-time high, where access is inadequate, and um, where there are so many kind of preventable costs that come from under treatment. Uh, if anyone wants to read a good uh, book about this, Susan Lazar has published uh, a, a book about um, uh, psychotherapy, and I think it is called psychotherapy is worth it, uh, and and it really talks about the the, uh, the the amount of money that's lost by under treating, and we are we really lose sight of that because we're very much a now oriented culture. We don't think about down the road issues. So yes, legislation is critical on both federal and state levels. The more states pass something, the more the federal. Uh, uh, government is likely to pick up as well, and vice versa. So we've got uh, to work closely, and we've got to model legislation in uh, states outside of California, Illinois, and Oregon uh, that can that can um, uh, take up the mantle. And last, we have to hold regulators accountable. Um, we assume that regulators do their job, but I would say that's not true. Um, uh, some regulators do their job. And many don't, and many just uh, aren't pressed. And so even in states with good laws, we've got to educate the regulators and hold them accountable. And, and you know, that has to happen at the very top level. And, and hopefully as many people on the call today will, will um, contact David and, and Linda and see kind of how they can join forces to help. And one thing I, I just want to reiterate the, the importance of the federal level too. I mean, if we could get like, for example, California, the 855 and get that as, as federal law, that would have a, you know, a massive impact. And I will say as much as I made the comment before about difficulty of passing things, one area that one of the very few areas that crosses party lines is mental health. Both, both parties, at least on the service, say that's something that they're in favor of, of trying to strengthen mental health coverage. So that's an area where maybe there might be some room to accomplish something. I will say, yes, definitely join the Kennedy Forums list, join Psychotherapy Action Network. And then there's also a court of public opinion. And so talk about the work that you do, talk about the evidence base, talk about um, the impact that you're making as a therapist and why it's important that this therapy be paid for and respected. And I think use the media if you can, use your own website, your own platform, if. Uh, if you're on social media, I think all of these things, you know, regulators and policymakers and legislators are read those those things too. And the more we can get our, our version of the narrative out there, the stronger we'll be. And one thing I want to make sure people are aware is in the toolkit is very helpful. Um, we have a chart there. So when we talk about the regulators, what the regulator is who regulates a plan is gonna depend on what kind of plan it is. So you're gonna see a chart in there that's gonna to speak to the different kinds of plans and who is actually responsible for regulating that plan and therefore who um, you know complaints will ultimately be brought to. So I wanna just let, um, let you know that that's gonna be available. Okay, wow. Well, we 
uh, have so many more things we could be talking about. Um, and I know there's still a lot of questions we didn't get a chance to get to. I just want to thank everyone in attendance tonight for all your questions and, and your thoughts. And really, um, thank you so much to our panelists. Again, as many people have said, thank you for the work you do in this area, for your advocacy. Um, and again, the toolkit link, you should have that now. The recording is going to go out to attendees after the event, so you will have access to the recording. And uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us here tonight.